Welcome, everyone. Today, my guest is managing editor James Kleiman to talk about real estate agent commissions and why they are rising even as housing affordability has gotten worse. James, welcome back to the podcast. Hey, good to be back. Thanks for having me. Great to have you. Let's talk about real estate commissions, right? This is a very interesting topic to our audience and maybe particularly interesting to you and I. I'm trying to sell a house. And you just closed yep. on a house. So let, let's talk about what's the latest. And uh, first of all, give us an update on your house. Okay. So a couple years back, my wife and I, we were scared about the virus. We were scared there might be other pandemics. We didn't want to be in the city, in New York City. Uh, we, we lived in Brooklyn. And, um, you know, in the early days, the first month or two was really scary. You'd hear all the sirens and, you know, there were mass graves everywhere. And it was, uh, it was very frightening. And so we started to look at plans and thinking about, is there an affordable area where we might be able to get away from the city, but also maybe something when we start a family, you know, that has different kinds of amenities, uh, you know, hiking or uh, pools. There are very few swimming pools in New York City, as you might imagine. And, um, and so, you know, the, the funny thing about the area is, if you go two hours in any direction, almost any direction, you immediately get priced out unless you make a lot of money or have been very fortunate in inheriting money. Uh, and so if you go north, you get the Hudson Valley and it's just exploded over the last couple of years. If you go to the east, you get Long Island and the Gold Coast and the Hamptons and, you know, say no more, right? Everybody knows that that's, that's you know, in the million dollar plus territory. And then you go south and you really kind of get to the Jersey Shore. But if you go west, you get out to the Poconos, which in they're, they're in Pennsylvania. It's, you know, part of the Appalachian Mountains. And it's really the only kind of vacation-y, nature-y area within two hours, two and a half hours of New York City that is not ungodly like expensive and um, still relatively family friendly. And so we thought, you know, if we've got about $250,000, $300,000 to spend, I'm not, I'm not getting anything, but like maybe a studio apartment in New York city. I can't get anything in those aforementioned areas, but I can get something in the Poconos. And so we started looking around an area called Pocono Lake and, uh, and we spotted a house that, you know, it was a four bedroom, two bath, really a 1.5 bath. And it needed some work. It had been built in the seventies, didn't have a lot of upgrades and we were able to get it for 217. And mortgage rates at the time, I got a rate of about 2.7% as a first time home buyer. And that was, you know, conventional standard Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac mortgage. Uh, I think we put like 15% down, so like a good amount, but not, you know, nothing crazy. And um, we originally envisioned it as a weekend house where we'd leave the city. You know, it's, it was also because it was so affordable in case something happened. My wife and I both work in media. You lose a job and suddenly your rent is, you know, $3,000 a month. Well, it's a lot better if you have a fallback and the mortgage was about 1200 a month. And so that was pretty doable. So, you know, I, I thought it was good planning. And in the end, what happened was we ended up having a child and all these things you imagine often never come true. <laughs> and so, you know, getting, getting a crying baby in a car to go two and a half hours each way and then deal with traffic that's even worse, you know, going back to the city was just too much. And so we ended up renting it out on Airbnb, but then you need a property manager and it ends up being that you don't really make a heck of a lot in profits, but it's still a short-term rental friendly community. And I think it's a good value. You just can't go to a lot of places in America and get a four bedroom, two bath house for under $275,000. So we ultimately made the decision, if we're not going to use it, we don't want to be Airbnb investors and property managers. Let's just sell it. I, I didn't want to get rid of the mortgage rate, but I care more about the continuity of my family and the lifestyle. And if we're not using it, we're not taking advantage of it. Why? Let, let somebody who wants to actually utilize the property do it. So we listed it on April 1st. I had initially played around with the idea of doing an agent only listing, which is basically you pay somebody who will just put it on the MLS and you pay a flat fee. In this case, it would have been $299. They put it on the MLS. You write the description, any calls, any inquiries, open houses, 
any marketing beyond that is up to you. They just listed on the MLS so you don't get knocked for, you know, having a FISBO listing. And I thought about the idea. I talked to my wife about it and she's like, this is our most valuable asset. Do you really want one to be doing all the work of the agent to be taking calls during your busy day job when you already get calls and already in meetings? And two, do you want to risk amateur hour when we're trying to sell this home and I said, okay, yeah, you're right. And and I totally chickened out and I decided instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the most productive agent in the area. And so fortunately at HW, we have access to a lot of great software. And I was able to find the agent who had sold the most homes in this community at um, list price or above and had the shortest number of days between listing and closing. And so I felt pretty good about it. She's very competent. And we listed, I suggested the price of $269,000. So a little over $40,000 more than I paid in September of 2021. And within three days, I had two full price offers and was probably, was expected to receive a third um, the following day. And at that point, I was like, you know what? I already got what I wanted and I'd rather close quickly and not pay the extra mortgage payment, not pay the extra HOA fee not pay, you know, all of the related expenses that come with maintaining a house. And so we went with a buyer who was already in underwriting. She's also a real estate agent and she paid full price and we were in contract and ready to go. And with the exception of a little back and forth on some very minor repair requests, uh, we closed within a month. So I closed on Friday, April 28th. So 27 days after going into contract. And the agents ended up getting the full 6% split. And going into it, I knew that this is what the real estate agent was going to push for. They, they know I reached out to them. You know, they, they didn't get this listing from a referral. I, I reached out directly and I was very clear about what I was looking for in a deal. And the agent was very clear that, look, I will only lower my commission if I also find the buyer. And she had a lot of contacts in the investor world. And this is an area which there are a lot of investors who end up buying these houses and turning them into Airbnbs or long-term rentals or whatever. So I felt like there was a good chance I might save, you know, a, a percentage point just in um, her possibly finding the buyer. It ended up not happening. Um, and I paid 6%. And so the agent split 16000 I think like $240. And then, of course, the brokerage. Uh, also takes a cut of that as well. And it got me thinking, as a consumer, is this good value? And I like the agent. I thought she did a good job, but $16,000 is a lot of work. Uh, I'm sorry, is a lot of money. And I don't know that there's a ton of work involved if it's under contract in, you know, a couple hours or a couple days. And this kind of thing happens a lot in America because there's so little inventory. And depending on where you are, you might receive full price offers in 48 hours and 72 hours. And then the question becomes, do you want to take the risk and, and choose a different model? It's interesting because I have the opposite problem, right? So I put, um, our house has been for sale now in, um, it is in Kansas. So a little bit of a, of a different area and not a resort area at all. Um, and we have had zero offers and I've had to uh, lower the price. So I feel like my agent up there is absolutely working like crazy. They've had a ton of open houses. We've had a lot of traffic. Uh, people don't like the way the backyard looks. So nothing I can do <laughs> about, uh, this particular physical feature, but, uh, yeah, that's really interesting. And it really it really speaks to like some of the data that we're seeing on agent commissions right now, despite it being a pretty unaffordable market, they haven't really changed. No, well, they, they did a little bit and we'll get to that. I, I spoke to Tracy Velt, who is the uh, the editorial director uh, and and she's been covering real estate agents and brokerages for a, a very long time and is really an expert, has a lot more expertise than I have on this. And so I, I wanted to to look into where we are in the, the real estate commission life cycle. And it turns out they started in 1991 when Real Trends first tracked the data 
at about 6%. And then they've kind of been in that 5 6% range until you get to 2020, and they dipped below 5% down to 4.94%. But then you started to see something interesting, which is they jumped right back up. So they jumped up a little bit back over 5% in 2021, and then reached 5.32% in 2022. And I expect they'll probably be even higher in 2023. And the reason might surprise you. The reason is a lot of the average performers, a lot of the low performers of the real estate agents set, they're not getting listings. They're not getting on the deal. They're washing out of the industry. And so the top performing agents, like the agent that I worked with, they don't negotiate their splits. They say, look, it's 6%. My services or you know, my, my cut is 3%. And then I'm also, you know, going to suggest 3% on the buy side as well. And that's what you pay. And if you don't want to use my services, if you want to go a different direction, that's up to you. That is a consumer choice, but this is what it costs to utilize my services. And I knew that going in after the first conversation. And so I don't feel like I've been cheated or anything like that. I I think she did a very good job because as I said, I got exactly what I wanted, right? I got full price and they closed within the month. But I think there, there are a lot of different markets out there where you could see people considering a different direction. And there are a lot of new players involved as well. And so when we look at the maybe the scale of where real estate commissions have been, they've mostly been in the five-ish range when we've had a reasonable amount of inventory. When we talk about a very different housing market environment, we're really looking at 2020, 2021, 2022, and 2023. We don't have a lot of data on that. And so if you look solely at the idea that higher performing agents are grabbing an outsized uh, market share and they're going to keep their splits you know, on the higher side, we won't see declines on the agent commission side. But there are two factors that I think could change the equation. And one is a very, very significant threat and it's of the legal nature, and that's the moral case. And this is, of course, a case that's been winding its way through the courts for quite some time. And the long short of it is um, there are it's a class action against the NAR, the National Association of Realtors, and several of the top brokerages. And the claim is effectively that sellers are subsidizing the buy-side agents, and there's a lack of transparency. And it's an anti-competitive practice. And it could be, in in terms of damages, worth $13 billion, which is far in excess what any of these top brokerages even have in terms of market cap. And so this would be a huge killer to the idea of the traditional agent commission structure, which has endured for more than 100 years. You know, we're, we're talking the 1910s when the structure that we now still use Uh, really came into existence. And another factor is that there are all kinds of other companies that are looking at ways to reduce affordability uh, or make affordability more in line with what people, you know, uh, are able to pay. Uh, It's no secret that affordability is at its worst worst, uh, period in, in decades. And there are a few key ways to bring it down. One, the home sale prices right? Prices drop. We see that in some markets. We see that in the markets that had a lot of helium, especially in the Sun Belt. Um, But then you also look at the fees. And that's another way of reducing uh, some of the costs associated with buying and selling a house. And so if one were to use, say, a discount broker, or in the example that I'd considered uh, a listing-only agent, you could save $10,000 plus easily. And if you have a lot of data that suggests there are way more buyers than there are sellers, you could roll the dice and think you might be able to save yourself $10,000 and get full listing and come out way ahead. Um, But I think the reality is, and and the data bears this out from the last couple of years, is that people are too scared to do it. People have been able to negotiate commissions for years now. That has not changed the structure that has been in place for a century plus 
has remained extremely resilient. It has survived legal challenges. It has survived federal regulator, uh, <laughs> you know, interest. It has survived the advent of the internet and consumers having more information and the ability to perform their own in-depth research. And that hasn't changed. People are going to use a real estate agent 90% of the time. You know, in about 8% of cases, they won't. They'll do it alone. They'll go, you know, what they call FISBO for sale buyer only. And um, that's just really rare. People don't want to bet on themselves. And so I don't think the commissions are going to come down all that much. But at a certain point, affordability is the driving force that that will lead to, I think, more models. And, um, you know, the, the other factor being that if the NAR loses this case, then suddenly you have buyers that would be negotiating their own commissions, which they really don't do currently because it's baked into the sale on the sell side. And you need, <laughs> consumers are not comfortable negotiating with agents. They're not on the sell side. They're definitely not on the buy side, right? And so I think that there is a very strong likelihood that some of the portals, some of the marketplaces would begin to offer that kind of service. And um, the more often people decide to you know, use Zillow to negotiate a commission for a buy side agent, which they've already been pushing, right? Um, then I think that changes and that puts downward pressure on the whole commission system. Hi, I'm McKenna Clay, Events and Program Specialist here at HW Media, and I wanted to invite you to our upcoming event this summer. A theme we've heard from housing leaders this year is the importance of relationships to not only survive, but be strategic in 2023. And that's why we decided to invite the top C-suite executives and leaders in mortgage to join us at Gathering of Eagles in Austin, Texas from June 18th until 21st. Now, Gathering of Eagles has historically been exclusive to the nation's most elite brokerage, association and team leaders, and C-suite leaders. But for the first time this year, we're opening up the audience to include execs from mortgage, title, and insurance so that you can connect and build vital partnerships for your business. If you want to learn more, visit the events page on realtrends.com and you can get registered today to come hang out with us in Austin. So very interesting. And I think um, I'd love to address those uh, separately. So first of all, on the on the NAR lawsuit side, do, where are we on that? I know that it has gone through uh, several stages. Like, do we think that that is something that could actually happen? Well, <laughs> it really depends who you talk to. Everybody involved has, has skin in the game. And so you're going to hear a wide range of different opinions on it. I think people who are on the more discount brokerage side who are, um, you know, in favor of a radical change to how commissions are structured will tell you that anything can happen at trial. And they feel that it's a very strong case against the NAR and, and the other brokerages. If you talk to people in the brokerage space, not that they're not worried. I, I think anyone has to be concerned about a class action lawsuit that could forever upend the way your industry makes money. Um, I don't think they feel that they're going to lose the case. And the reason is because people have known for a very long time that they can negotiate commissions. People have known for a long time that they don't have to use agents either. And so those are, I think, pretty compelling arguments in favor of people, um, you know, being able to not, subscribe to the system if they don't want to. Uh, I didn't have to choose the agent that I ended up going with. I could have found a discount brokerage. I could have done a FISBO if I wanted to, and then I would have maybe just paid out the buyer's agent 2.5% or 3% and saved myself $10,000 doing that. I decided not to because I didn't feel that in the end it was worth the risk. But we'll see. Like I said, anything can happen at trial. And this is going to trial because they can't really settle it. If they're seeking $13 billion in damages, potentially even more, you know, like, what do you say, $5 billion? You know, meet in the middle. And then there goes Compass. There goes Anywhere. There goes Keller Williams. You know, that that kills uh, uh, just too many potential, um, you know, companies right then and there. So it, it's it's going to trial. 
It's going to trial. And it is interesting, our two different um, scenarios. So if you had known, maybe you were like, hey, that would be great if, you know, if you'd saved that $10,000 on my side, there is no way I, I, I'm in the Dallas-Fort Worth area now. There's no way I could be doing what my agent is doing um, in, in Kansas for that. And he is working hard for whatever commission he's going to end up getting <laughs> because um, we'll, we'll see. Well, let's take the second part there. We, for years, you know, a decade maybe, we've been talking about who is going to disrupt and replace the real estate agent. And of course, you know, the Zillow was the big one. I mean, that that yeah. was, you know, the the boogeyman that everyone saw, but as you said, I mean, it feels like there's something about this transaction that is not the same as an Amazon or an Uber or whatever you want to compare it to where people want to see all that information and they then they want a friendly hand taking them through it. Yeah, I mean, that's that's really I think the heart of it, there are discount brokerages and, and they say that high commissions are often the result of marketing inefficiencies. So there is Rex, which is uh, an ongoing lawsuit with Zillow. There's Clever, there's Redfin, there are all of these other um, discount brokerages out there. None of them have managed to gain the kind of market share that would, I think, ultimately result in significant change to how people do business in the real estate space. There are, however, some other interesting models that are coming to the forefront. So Redfin, you know, they, they operate a little bit differently than most in that they offer full services. Not all discount brokerages offer that, you know, suite of services. And, and the claim is a Redfin agent couldn't, should be as good as any other agent in America that is offering, you know, the full 6% experience. Right. And, and, they have been at times as big as the fifth largest brokerage in the country. No one else is even close. There's there's no one even close to the pantheon um, of, of, of Redfin in terms of kind of combining those services with the heft of just deal volume, right? They touch so many more deals than others. Um, but there are other players that you don't traditionally think of in the brokerage space that are, I think, potentially going to be game changers. Open Door is a company that I don't think is in great financial condition. No one I know thinks that either. And um, they do still have a very significant place in the American real estate system because they are a huge owner of properties and they do have consumer recognition I think a lot of people know what Open Door is. I think a lot of people also know what Zillow is. They have a partnership. Open Door now has an exclusive listings platform. It's a marketplace. It's called Open Door Exclusives. And you can go in there. It's, I believe, only offered right now in a couple markets in Texas. But let's say I'm looking for a house in Denton right outside the Dallas area. And I don't want to go through the whole rigmarole of getting an agent and going through all the open houses. I know what I want. I can do a virtual tour like a lot of millennials or Gen Z and I see a price that I like. I click on the listing. Everything looks good. I can buy that house right then and there. I could just click the button. There's no agent. If I have my own agent, I have to cover his or her fees. Um, and we're starting to see other companies start to have this sort of marketplace model and I think as consumers become more educated, as consumers get more comfortable doing more of these transactions online, it will lead to some change in, uh, you know, how they transact. And that's not good for an agent, no matter what, because often that means that they're left out of the equation. At the same time, all of this is happening. Open Door is still incentivizing agents. You know, Open Door is still trying to work with agents. Zillow is still you know, in a very complicated relationship with agents, but still working with them and, and in some cases offering them outsized commissions to get them to, you know, be involved in some of these deals. So as much as we're seeing, um, you know, companies that offer platforms that could cut out an agent from the transaction, we're seeing them also hedge that risk by working with agents on the other side. There are a couple out there that are auction style Rob Hahn, he's an industry consultant. Uh, he has a new platform that's that's coming out. I think he's just in Phoenix right now. Um, but there are a couple out there as well. And and look, if you're in 
in a hot market and you know that your neighbor recently sold and they paid $35,000 in agent commissions and they had five full price offers in a day and you're thinking all they did is put a description on the MLS and take some pictures. Like, did I need to pay $35,000 for that? Like, no, maybe I'll choose a different route. I think that will eventually come to some level, but at the end of the day, never bet against the real estate commission structure. It's been around a hundred years plus, And we know that people are aware that they can negotiate and they don't, they don't, they don't want to go with a discount broker. They don't want to go with, uh, you know, the FISBO listings. So I I think it will endure unless the court cases really shake something out of this tree. Um, I think we're just going to see slight escalations of, you know, that 5.32 going slightly north um, and maybe in some years because of the market going a little bit down, but. I I would bet on this thing the way it is. That is so fascinating. Thank you so much for kind of walking us through that because it is something that I think is in in some ways very easy for consumers to understand. Like this is the part of the real estate. You know, we're not talking about the the mortgage process. We're like, oh, we're, you know, let's get into the weeds. It's like, this is something that anybody who has bought or sold a, a house has felt the pain of, but also benefited from, right? If if they had to get an agent or they know the process. And so I I do think this is really interesting and and as you said, that commission structure seems unassailable, even though it has been it has been assailed. <laughs> People yes. are, have tried, right? Unsuccessfully, yes. Unsuccessfully. Well, James, thanks so much for being on, walking us through that. And I will talk to you again soon, I'm sure. All right. Thanks, Sarah. Take care.